Hello, this is Mark Unkefer. I'm Executive De Director of the Fiber Optic Sensing Association, and welcome to this uh, one of our uh, May webinars. We've uh, stepped up the pace of them, and this one is the product of FOSA's Technology Committee, so it is the collective work of uh, those folks who do quite a bit of the work of the association. Uh, and then with this, we will be focusing on applications involving uh, uh, strain and particularly where it's used for uh, detecting uh, movement in uh, uh, erosion dams and uh, other civil engineering structures. Uh, and I'm pleased to kind of have this set start off with uh, Gareth Lees, who is the uh, uh, chairman of uh, FOSA's uh, technology committee and it sort of was the source of all of this. And then he'll hand off to Ed Ten. Uh, Roshad of Omnisense, who will provide the body of the uh, presentation. Okay, uh, thank you, Mark. Thanks for the introduction. Yes, so my name's Gareth Lees. Um, I'm the, the chairman of the technology committee for FOSA um, and the CTO of AP Sensing. Um, I just want to take a, a couple of minutes just to explain um, what FOSA is about and, uh, and what we actually do. Uh, so, FOSA, the Fiber Optic Sensing Association, uh, it's a non-profit industry association, and uh, we were formed in 2017 uh, in Washington, D.C. So we're, we're quite a young organization, uh, but very active. Um, and although we're, we're based in, in Washington, uh, the membership is open um, to companies globally around the world. And actually, uh, our members are, uh, are based um, um, in many different locations throughout the world. Um, so a lot of the activities we, we do within FOSA is to educate people on uh, the benefits of fiber optic sensing. Uh, and we do this through a, a number of different ways. Um, so I've listed just a few of the things we do here. Um, obviously, we do webinars, and, and this is one of the webinars um, run by the Technology Committee. There are other webinars um, each month run by our, our member organizations. Um, these are all on YouTube, um, so please go and have a look at uh, YouTube. There's a lot of really interesting things there. Um, we also produce uh, white papers. Uh, we work with uh, industry, um, industry bodies to develop standardized practices. Um, and we do a lot of public policy advocacy uh, in the US. Um, so if you move on to the next slide. Yeah, so... Um, I've just discussed a few of the things we do. So in a bit more detail, um, on, on the website, there are things we call technology primers. Um, in the industry, in the fiber optic industry, we use a lot of acronyms, uh, DTS, DAS, uh, DSS. Uh, within the, the website, there are primers um, on what these different technologies are. And it gives us a one page overview of um, what is a DTS or what is a DSS. Um, so they're, they're really useful um, if you're just coming to the technology as, as a new technology. Uh, then we move on into a lot more detail and we have um, a set of documents called installation considerations. Um, and these are more comprehensive documents and they explain uh, a lot about the, the things that you need to consider if you're going to use the technology for different application areas. Um, and again, these are all on the website. They're, they're all free. Um, you can go and have a look. Um, um, so, uh, uh, if you go onto our website uh, on the right hand side there, you'll see there's a resources section um, and all of the things I've just discussed are available on there. So, uh, please go and have a look. In addition to all the kind of resources that are on the website, um, we attend uh, a lot of external conferences uh, and we work with a lot of external bodies. Um, so, we're trying to increase the visibility of fiber optic sensing um through these kind of uh, outreach um, activities and we have a very active technology committee we meet every month um, and we've got a lot of projects ongoing um, we split the work into task forces and those task forces go and uh, do various activities so i don't want to take up too much of your time so i'll hand it over to etienne now who's got a really interesting talk on structural health monitoring so over to you etienne Thank you, Gareth. Good morning, good afternoon. My name is Etienne Rocha. I am the CTO of Omniscience based in Switzerland, and I'm a member of the 
for SA Technology Committee. And uh, today I will uh, discuss with you what we can do in terms of distributed fiber optic sensing generally, but then very quickly going into strain monitoring and what we can do with strain monitoring uh, for structural health monitoring. Generally speaking, within FOSA, uh, we support different applications of optical sensing. Um, this includes, for instance, pipeline condition monitoring, leak, for instance, uh, pipeline heat trace monitoring, third party intrusion and security checking that nobody is, is coming to a place where it's not supposed to come. Uh, we also have application in geotechnics, in transport, uh, so related to train and railroad, uh, active oil and gas in well monitoring. Uh, there are some applications also for industrial process, um, large structures like dam and bridges and walls and also a power cable. The concept is the uh, following. We are using an optical fiber, basically a piece of glass that guide lights that is installed uh, in the case shown there along the pipeline and will send some pulse of light down the structure. And then the fiber will react by sending back a little bit of light that we call the backscattered light. And then by analyzing the properties of the backscattered light, then we have access to um, different type of measurement, for instance, strain, that is the topic of today, or temperature or vibration uh, or, or other things. So basically by looking at what the fiber backscattered to us and by having the uh, relevant technology then we can do some measurement all along the fiber. Uh, we will call that distributed measurement because we will use the full fiber um, as, as a sensor and eventually we will uh, use those data to provide a, a useful information on the uh, asset. We will speak about DSS, distributed strain sensing, DTS, distributed temperature sensing, and also about DAS, distributed acoustic sensing or, or vibration. Um, the topic of today is really on, on the first part, on, on strain. What is important in distributed fiber optic sensing is that we have a single fiber um, that we interrogate from a position where we have the interrogator, and then we get the full coverage of the fiber. It works 24-7. Um, it goes over long distance, and when we say long distance, it's tens of kilometers, hundreds of kilometers. Um, it has a, a high spatial resolution, as we call it, so the, the capability to see small events of meter size, typically, over long distance. And then what is interesting also is the fact that the sensor is passive. It's just a piece of glass, so you don't need power along the asset. You just need um, network and power by the interrogator. As said, we can measure strain, temperature, vibration, the application with magnetic field radiation, and probably many more that are not cited uh, there. And it's an upgradable technology. So if you have an interrogator today, you can benefit from the next generation without replacing the sensor because the fiber is the fiber and it stays there. What is important to say, the, the key benefits of the technology? Uh, to begin with, it's reliable. Uh, the, the interrogator has been designed to be in the field. Um, the, the fiber itself, the piece of glass, is protected into a, an optical cable. They have been around in all sorts of environments for years now, so not much can go wrong with that. The sensor is, is passive, it's often dielectric, um, so it's intrinsically safe, it's secure. Uh, most of the time, it's the cable, the sensing cable is buried or is affixed to the to the structure. It could be installed um, over mast and so on. Uh, if someone tries to tamper with the fiber, you will very quickly see it. It's also economical because the the cost of sensing location when you have tens of kilometers and so on is extremely uh, small, but very much interesting. And it's also uh, scalable. Um, you can use multiple technologies on the same cable. Most of the cable have multiple fibers, so you can scale that. And you can also use pretty much all the concepts of the telecommunication. So there, there are tricks that you can use in the background to help you with scalability. And uh, it's distributed, meaning that uh, you see everything along the fiber. So you have thousands of points along the asset that are monitored um, in near real time. For today, I will concentrate on geo 
techniques, so the, the measurement of things related to geohazards like soil erosion, subside and landslide, and there will be case studies on that, and also on large structures or so deformation of piles and walls and, and so on, um, with uh, case studies in that field as well. Before going to the case study, let me introduce Mr. Brillouin. Um, Brillouin, Léon Brillouin, a French physicist, was working about 100 years ago in the field of quantum mechanics and solid state physics. In parallel, Mr. Mandelstam was also working in quantum mechanics. And between both of them, they, they managed to uh, discover inelastic backscattering and the interaction of scattering uh, with light. And today, the, the backscattering that we are using to measure strain and deformation along an asset uh, is referred to as Brillouin backscattering. The, the field started with the first demonstration of a Brillouin analyzer for attenuation measurement back in uh, 89. So it took some time be between the theoretical work by Mandelstam and Brillouin and then the first demonstration uh, in fiber. Um, 1990, the first demonstration of temperature and strain measurement um, in a loop configuration known as BOTDA. I'll come back to that later on. And shortly after that, um, in a single end, uh, approach that we call BOTDR. There has been thousands of publications, still are many publications right now, a lot of patent, and so that we can say today that this is a mature technology uh, for the measurement of temperature and strain. How does it work? Well, we have a, a piece of fiber in a sensing cable. We have an instrument that we call BOTDR, BOTDA, or, or other uh, fancy names, and we are going to send a pulse of light down the fiber. And as the pulse propagate, um, then we'll have some backscattering coming back to a photodiode. The first thing we do is a time domain analysis. Basically, we know the speed of the light down the fiber, we know the time, and therefore we know from where the backscattering is coming. We have the distance measurement. And then uh, Brillouin is sending us a, a backscattering um, that has some offset with respect to the central laser, as shown there. So th there is a frequency shift with respect to the, to the pump laser. And that frequency shift is going to change if there is, for instance, some strain, so that in the raw data, which looks like a mountain chain, we suddenly have related to strain an offset. And if we have the proper calibration coefficient, then we can work out what was the uh, strain status of the fiber initially and what is the local strain at the place where we have the additional deformation. There are different flavors. The one shown there is known as BOTDR, so single fiber interrogation. Um, there is a loop configuration known as BOTDA, where a probe signal is sent to the end of the fiber and then come back and crosses the pump and doing so stimulates the Brillouin scattering. And then you have also a um, Brillouin interrogator working directly in the frequency domain known as BOFDR, BOFDA, or also in the correlation domain. Each have their pros and cons, but I won't go further into the details there for that uh, particular presentation. All these technologies eventually gives you information on temperature or strain or both. And then we speak about DTS, TSS or DTSS um, in our jargon. What is very important is to understand the key parameters that are defining those instruments. And um, we have now, since a couple of years, a standard written by IEC, which defines the terminology um, and also express how we can measure those different parameters. The standard was originally designed for uh, temperature, but with Brillouin, because we can measure both temperature and strain, then we can use the same definition for strain then we do for temperature. The first parameter is the distance measurement range. It's the how far we can go. Are we going 10 kilometer, 50 kilometer, 100 kilometer? Uh, the second parameter is the spatial resolution. That is basically the, the size of the shortest event that we can measure. And then obviously there is a matter of time. How long does it take uh, to gather the information? And obviously we want to know how well we gather that information, which is what we call the uh, repeatability. Now, what is extremely important is that all those parameters are interrelated by the physics. Um, and they, they are given basically by the noise of the instrument, by how the instrument was, was designed and, and optimized. So 
As an example, I plotted on the right hand side those parameters. Um, arbitrarily, I decided that the repeatability of one was given at 50 kilometer with three meter spatial resolution and 15 minutes. It doesn't matter what one is at that stage, it's purely for the understanding. If I change the measurement time and I reduce it from 15 minutes to about one minute, then the, the physics imposes that the repeatability goes from one to about a factor four in this case same instrument. Um, if I am in this position at 50 kilometer and I decide to keep the same spatial resolution and measurement time, but I increase the sensing distance to about 80 kilometer, then we end up somewhere up there. And when we are at that 80 kilometer, I can improve the repeatability by, for instance, increasing the spatial resolution. So I make a compromise and say, I don't want to see events which are three meter long. I'm happy with seeing events which are five meter long. Why is that important? Those curves basically represent the same instrument, but just in different condition. So when we do a, a strain measurement project, what we have to do is to look for what is the main criteria, are we in the distance? Are we in the speed? Are we in the repeatability or the spatial resolution? And then the other parameter basically uh, will be adjusted according to what the instrument can do. The only thing which is not possible is to have the best of all these parameters independently. And I think this is important. Having said that, typically the how far is anywhere up to 100 kilometer for a single instrument. Uh, the how short, is a quarter of a meter typically, um, and then it can go up to about 10 meter longer than that. Probably doesn't make much sense for the uh, structural health monitoring. The measurement time, that typically starting in what second for the, the dynamic measurement, um, and then it goes probably to 30 minutes longer than that, uh, is probably not so useful anymore. And the strain repeatability, um, goes anywhere from two micro deformations so or two micrometer per meter um, up to about 200 or something like this. And then based on that, you have the combination of those parameters as shown in the previous figure. Brillouin, as I quickly mentioned, um, is sensitive to both temperature and strain. It has a linear dependence on both. So if we look at the deformation, we can define epsilon as being the uh, elongation divided by the initial uh, length of the fiber. Uh, that's where we speak about micro deformation or micrometer per meter. And the strain coefficient is typically about 500 megahertz per percent, meaning that the, the frequency or the, the color of the backscatter signal is changing by an amount of 500 megahertz per percent. In temperature, um, then the, the Brillouin spectrum, basically the cross-section of the mountain chain I, I showed before, is shifting also linearly with the temperature as shown in that figure. And then the, the slope of the uh, temperature coefficient is about one megahertz per degree C. So then normally comes the question, how can we discriminate between strain and temperature? Um, most of the uh, BOTD, AR, or the other version of Brillouin do not distinguish natively between um, strain and temperature. So what is done typically in, in most applications, probably the easiest way of doing that uh, for structural health monitoring, is to have a loose fiber, which provides measurement of temperature only, and then to have a, a tight fiber, that is sensitive to both temperature and a strain. And then we can do back computation from the thermal effect on the, on the strain fiber and extract the relevant deformation. Um, in some cases, temperature is not an issue. Typically, if one is looking at ground movement and we are expecting 1% elongation on the fiber, the fact that there are a few hundred micro deformation more or less due to temperature is not an issue. But if you are working with walls and piles and things like this, then it's probably very important that you do have a temperature information and you need to make sure that the temperature is measured close to the strain sensing cable, otherwise you will have issues. So that's enough for the theory and let's move to the uh, application. So I will speak about pipeline monitoring, about geohazard monitoring, tunnel, dams, walls and piles. 
I'm not an expert in all of these, and I already thank uh, many of my colleagues who provided information for that, and I hope I will say the, the right things. Um, why is that important to look at geohazard monitoring? Example, a long pipeline. Well, you can have ground movement like landslides, landslide or, or subsidence soil erosion, which may impact the structure. So if you, if you are capable of measuring that ground movement uh, before it has an impact on the structure, then you can maybe do prevention work or the supporting work of, of the of the land and, and do things like this. So you obtain this information by having the sensing cable in the vicinity of the structure. And then you can go one step further, uh, which is to add also strain measurement, deform deformation measurement directly on the structure, in, in this particular case, the pipeline, so that you can also know if the pipeline was impacted um, by the landslide or, or no. And by doing this, you really grab the early sign of things moving in the soil, and then you can prevent a catastrophic failure. The first example is uh, a measurement of pipeline deformation. Um, in this case, a, a strain sensor was integrated between the polyethylene pipe and the concrete coating. One sensor that we see here was uh, integrated longitudinally. The other one was coiled around the pipe, and then concrete coating was applied on top of the system. And then that length of pipe was lifted up with a crane and then obviously when we look at the at the deformation there we expect in this area for the fiber which is on the top of the pipeline to be under compression and in this area we expect the same fiber to be under traction and sure enough when you do the measurement with the Brillouin system that's exactly what you get so as the applied strain is increasing so as the pipe is going up and up and up uh, then we see more compression in the compression zone and then higher deformation uh, on the um, upper part of the of the curve so a clear um, visibility of compression and elongation, which shows that we measure strain in both direction. This is important. Another example of pipeline monitoring um, in the field this time on a, a route which is challenging, where you have a, a active tectonic area and seismic area, where you have also a lot of erosion and water coming from everywhere. And the, the scheme deployed there is a combination of ground movement in the right of way, uh, ground movement perpendicular to the right of way to, to see how the soil is, is reacting and the formation of the pipeline itself. Uh, so in this case, there were three strains transducer which were glued on the on the pipeline in the field with an automatic machine uh, a network cable that um, is used partially for temperature measurement and also for communication between the instruments and the section which are instrumented for strain not the full length was instrumented for strain and then in just at the, the limit of the backfield in the right of way, a strain sensing cable, which is there uh, to look at the deformation of the soil in general. An example of the landslide um, on the pipeline. Things like this usually move slowly, and we have here an example uh, where it takes about six weeks to increase the deformation to about 0.4%. Um, and we do see there on the picture that there is some crack zone there, so the land is going down. Uh, we also see on the right hand side that it's limited to just a few tens of meters. So by having the fiber in this area and by monitoring and alarming on those signals, it's possible to know exactly where the problem is and then it's possible to bring, for instance, uh, walls there to just stabilize the, the land before the uh, pipeline is damaged and eventually um, goes into rapture. An example of soil settlement. Um, in there, essentially, a, a lot of, of material will be damp on the original surface, and the expectation is that due to the load, then the soil will go down. And so the fiber that we originally put in the, in the soil will be deformed and we'll have a strain area in there and another strain area 
out there. And the measurement was made with this. Um, we could follow the settlement over time, and then we could compute back the, um, the, the depth of the, of the movement of the settlement based on the, on the strain that was measured there. Uh, that was about uh, four centimeters of, of movement in the ground at the time when the data was taken. So information also uh, very useful there. I'm just making a, a short um, change to the temperature because as with Brillouin, wine, we have access to both strain and temperature. There are some cases where we do measure ground movement, but suddenly we see signals which are related to temperature. That's the case here. It's a, a very localized signal um, that goes like, like a compression, but that was spotted um, for um, a, a cold spot, so related to temperature. There was a crack in the land, and so eventually water came in, made a cold spot to the to the cable, and you see over time a very um, deep reduction of the temperature, and then eventually it goes back to um, normal things as it stabilizes and, and gets back to a thermal equi equilibrium. It's interesting because you get access to erosion and then water ingress by using this, and for the same reason, you may have larger crack, and then the cable becomes becomes exposed um, to the ambient temperature. And as soon as the cable measures the ambient temperature, then you start having day-night thermal variation with a very clear pattern like this. And so you can localize that, uh, that there is an opening in the soil and do some uh, repair there. And well, once the repair is done, then temperature goes back to what it was supposed to be. Um, that is basically ground temperature and stable over time. Let's move now to uh, civil engineering with a couple of examples on tunnel monitoring. Um, that first example is a uh, water conveyance tunnel, which was instrumented with four fibers along the structures. And then we see on the right hand side the evolution of strain over time um, for some of the position of the, um, of the tunnel. So things are moving in there over time. Uh, with more detail, uh, another tunnel, um, in this case, a railway one, which was excavated in um, two steps. So first the upper part, then the bottom part. At the, near the entrance of the, of the tunnel, once the excavation was done, some strain sensing fibers and temperature sensing fibers were added on the wall and then concrete was sprayed over the, the fibers. So they now belong to the structure of the, of the tunnel. And then the tunnel was dig further. Uh, again, first the upper part and the bottom part follows. And so if we look at what happened on those fibers there on that cross section, over time, as the tunnel is being um, excavated, and that's what we see on the video, first we see the compression on the top and then the bottom part appears as it's being excavated. And so the tunnel somehow goes back uh, inside, so to speak. That lasted several weeks during the operation. Um, it looks big like this, but it's well within the limit of what it was supposed to be. So just confirm safe operation of the, of the system. Um, interestingly, if we look at different positions, so top on the side and on the bottom part over time, so obviously at the beginning there is no signal on the bottom part, um, it's just not excavated yet. We see the first compression coming in and then suddenly the, the bottom part excavation begins and so we see that it has some influence on the upper part as well and eventually after, after a few a few uh, days, weeks, then we see that the, the strain stabilized. That corresponds also to the fact that the excavation is much further away uh, to the position of the uh, measurement. Another example um, on the National Grid and Crossrail um, tunnels in, in London, so two cases. Um, on that figure, we see a molded piece of concrete which were um, added on, on the tube. They are instrumented and, and set there. Um, on the right hand side, it's the, the sprayed concrete version of the fibers. So fibers are applied, then concrete is sprayed, and then measurements start. 
Um, in those systems, there was a comparison between what was expected as, as deformation or bending moment on the structure, what was measured by the, the different fibers in the different position. And as expected, I would say, then the measurements are within uh, what was the, the design or the capacity limit of the tunnel. So that's rather good news. But the, it confirms that the measurement uh, is useful for that. Uh, on the right hand side, we see how the strain, the axial strain developed um, basically on that section of the tube as a crossing was, was coming there. So there was an opening going perpendicular to the, the picture that we see. And we have also the, the deformation, which is measured around there. Moving to a bridge monitoring, uh, the Göteborg Bridge. I won't do it in Swedish, that's not going to work. Um, that bridge was built in uh, 1939, it's about a kilometer long. Heavy traffic on top of that. And the people around there are waiting for a new bridge. And um, back around 2000, uh, there were some cracks that appeared in the concrete section. So there was a, a need for monitoring the bridge and making, sh making sure it could stay in safe operation for about another 15 years before the new bridge would be ready. So fibers and instrumentation was installed there back in 2005, has been measuring ever since. And normally next week, it should be a decommissioned as the new bridge will be ready. Um, the interest in that particular bridge um, first is to show some installation uh, on, on the structure with the cable and, and anchors and all that. That was five kilometer of strength sensing cable installed on that system. Um, what was measured uh, are cracks. Cracks in concrete are tiny aperture, typically 10 centimeter or less. So usually much smaller than the spatial resolution of most of the uh, instrument. And one trick that can be done with Brillouin, because it has a spectral component, uh, is to look for secondary peak. If you do have a crack somewhere in the concrete, then you will have uh, in the Brillouin spectrum a secondary peak. And by monitoring the, the offset between that secondary peak and the main one, you can get some information about uh, the opening of the, of the crack. So uh, a, a trick to monitor a bridge with a spatial resolution, which is larger than the crack itself. Another application is, is a dam, in this case, an earth dam, a reinforced earth dam um, in a valley in Austria. Um, it's a, a refill site for a tunnel excavation, and there was a need to um, support the, the road, which is coming from the top there, and relocate the river, which was in uh, the bottom of the valley. So about 25 meter uh, of, of the dam there. Uh, it was built by um, having geogrids, so something like a, a fabric, which is installed horizontally, and then there is uh, soil on top of that, and then another of those geogrids, and then it goes like this by layer um, from the from the bottom to the top. And there is a, a container with the instrumentation and then at different locations, there are fibers going horizontally into the, into the dam uh, to measure the um, deformation which is there. So we see the, the fiber circuit, which is uh, about two kilometer long. Um, looking over time, at, for instance, that position level two and by the edge and deeper inside. Uh, we see that during the construction of work, there was significant strain increase uh, at that particular level, which we can understand because as the system and get more and more and more soil on top of this layer, then we expect to have more effort and, and more uh, deformation. And Normally, if everything works well, um, once the system is finished, you expect strain to become stable over time. And this is what the figure there is demonstrating. So from the start of the measurement until the end of the work, there is a massive uh, increase in strain and then things are getting flat. It's important to say that that monitoring is part of the safety concept of the site. Um, so there are the measurements uh, which are done on, on that um, structure but the measurement of the fiber is key to the safety concept so should the strain increase massively then people would react and take measure another example of a tailing dam in chile 
um, high above, uh, high in altitude, about 2,800 meters um, near Santiago. It was instrumented with a hydrogeo cable, so looking at, at water ingress, water seepage, and deformation. Uh, it's all in the loop configuration, as shown in this um, case there. Um, and so, um, looking also at, at soil subsidence as the, the dam is filled up. Uh, no result that can be shared there, it's still work in progress, but that's an application. Another application also in, in the tailing dam um, was a, an extension uh, in two phases, and the numerical modeling shows that in some location there was a deformation of up to 17 centimeters that was expected. Um, so there is a there is a gallery which is uh, down there the gallery was instrumented with two combined strain and temperature sensor one on the top one on the side uh, about 275 meter and so looking at that uh, lateral displacement and settlement of the gallery also a work in progress let's move to pile monitoring um basically long piece of, of uh, concrete like columns which are in the in the soil first example uh, about 0.9 meter diameter pile uh, between 21 and 28 meter um, first in the uh, in homogeneous soil and then the bottom part in, in clay and dense sand so the system features four strain sensing cable that are uh, made in a single end configuration as shown here uh, with a cable a heavy duty cable that uh, can withstand elongation up to about one percent uh, the cable was installed with a small pretension in this case to have a better compression uh, measurement so installed at 90 degree and this is a close look of the end of the pile where you do see here uh, that piece of, of blue cable which is strapped to the metal part um, for the measurement of strain and then everything was prepared it was loaded from the top uh, with multiple cycles and when one is looking at the data uh, that we see in most cases that we have a linear load distribution related to skin friction so um, as we are pushing from the top then um, we, we have the, the larger values on, on the top and then it reduced the, until the bottom part. Um, it was also possible to see in some cases some in homogeneity um, along the, the pile and also some section where it was obviously sliding, um, so not so much uh, friction on that side. Another example of pile monitoring um, on the Isle of Dock in London, so somehow uh, there are some piles under there that are supporting those massive structure. Uh, one of the questions was the, related to the friction of the pile in the choke, which is at the bottom there. So uh, a test pile was built, about 1.5 meter in diameter, and we see how it was instrumented with part of the, of the fibers uh, gradually shown there and part of the installation process with the, with the pictures. That pile was tested from the bottom. So we have here a load cell, which is basically pushing it out of the ground. And uh, we see that there are a lot of materials around there. Um, and the question basically was the, the, the quality of the addition of the pile in those um, materials. So the, the figure is, is similar to the one before, symmetric, because it's being pushed from the, from the bottom. That's what we see um, on there. What is interesting is the fact that it was um, possible to compute the friction of the pile on the, on the different material and to uh, verify that uh, in the choke it was corresponding to what was expected and then there, there were also uh, interesting things like in this material to begin with there is almost no friction and then it comes in so like a threshold effect others have more linear uh, behaviors so a lot of uh, things to be learned from that measurement the pile was also instrumented for temperature monitoring so by monitoring temperature during the curing of the concrete it's possible uh, to compute um, the, the shape of the, the pile and somehow the, the shape also relates to the, the friction that we have at the at the end and so when the, the pile is, is somehow larger uh, in those red areas we'll have a stronger friction and opposite in the other area.
Also, example on retaining wall, um, Paddington Station in London Crossway project, so large aperture in the in the ground which uh, need to be supported so that the building the ground do not collapse. So you have uh, walls which are installed around there, and uh, one wall was uh, instrumented with a fiber optic there, and so then uh, everything is filled up with concrete in the in the field. So it's a retaining wall, and then the excavation started. And so there, there are some um, simulation of the behavior of the wall as the soil is, is removed there. And so we have the, the displacement of the, of the wall versus the depth uh, with, in pink, the finite element um, analysis, in green, the measurement uh, provided by the, by the fiber optic, and also in yellow, in kilometer data. And as Material is excavated and eventually crosses the tunnel and keep going down into the London clay. And we see some changes um, in the deformation of the of the wall, and we see also that the measurement, of the green trace, is perfectly matching of the expected or the simulated deformation. Well, all that is possible because we have cables. So let's talk about the cables. They are using single mode fibers, so pretty much the, the standard of telecommunication. What is important is a strong and homogeneous strain coupling from the asset to the fiber. What I want to say by this, if the coupling is not homogeneous, you may have a section of the fiber which doesn't react to the strain. And so you think nothing is moving, well, that's pretty much annoying. So it has to be to be good. Elongation, we understand is straightforward. You just get the fiber on each side and you, you put that's okay. Compression can be more challenging, but usually the cable, as we've seen in most of these applications, are embedded in, in concrete or in the structure. So basically the, the structure will take care of the compression of the cable. It can be installed in concrete, can be installed in trench, it's water resistant. And as it's borrowing from pretty much a lot of the telecommunication industry, uh, you have also all, all the real reliability of the, of the cable design, which is there. So it's designed for a long lifetime. Some example of, of cables, um, the first one, targeting elongation compression for civil engineering and ground movement is about eight millimeter um, outer diameter. It has a fiber in the center, it has a metal tube around there, and then it has a armor, uh, wire armor around there, so you can have a high tensile load on such a um, such a, a cable. Uh, it's it's really stiff, high compression also, so heavy duty civil engineering. Um, you have cables which are much smaller, uh, rectangular footprint, polymer base, eight by four millimeter, providing uh, both loose tube fiber for temperature measurement and strain sensing fiber for deformation. So that cable would have to be uh, protected somehow when attached to the, to the structure, has been used for crack detection for civil engineering work. And um, another example, which would be a combined ground movement telecommunication, general sensing, a cable which features loose tube fiber, so typically temperature and, and data, and tight buffer fibers that could be used for ground movement or also uh, for um, vibration. So it's just a, a quick selection. There are many more uh, solutions, but it gives some ideas of the, the type of cable that you could find uh, to do those jobs. And it's about time to conclude. Um, Bruin, it's 30 years of development and field and case study and, and all that. So has been proven, it's reliable. It provides train monitoring, temperature monitoring. Um, we have now a wide range of applications and, and case studies. What I presented today were just a few selection and uh, most of what I said in two slides could be presented in conference in 15 slides or so. Um, so there is a lot of, of information there. What is important? 
distributed state sex, uh, distributed strain sensing gives a, a rich strain of data set that you cannot get by having point sensors or inclinometer or, or things like this in the structure. So you really have a massive amount of data. But if you just have those data and they are sitting on the hard drive, there's not much you can do with it. Um, so the key or the, the value in that information is to compare, is to analyze, is to discuss those trend data together with the engineering of the, of the structure so that you can make a, a wise judgment on what is happening. Having said that, the technology is still improving. Uh, there is active developments within academia and industry, uh, still a lot of publication, a lot of new ideas. So it's not the end of the story, really not. I want to acknowledge a, a few people who helped me with this. Uh, to begin with, uh, Kenichi Soga at the University of Berkeley and Werner Linhart at the uh, University of Graz, who uh, provided uh, tunnels and walls and, and spies information. Uh, Wilhelm Hild uh, from NKD Photonics, who uh, gave me information on pipeline monitoring and piles. Also, my colleague Fabian Rave from Omniscience, who provided uh, landslides, subsidence, settlement, and, and erosion. And Daniel Inaudi at Smartech, uh, who gave information also on tiling dam and uh, bridges. I want to thank um, Gareth uh, for chairing us at the, at the TC, uh, and also Mark and Joy, who are active in the background to make sure that the webinar can uh, take place. So thanks to you all. Well, thank you, Etienne. And obviously, this was a very collaborative effort, and, and obviously the, the, the end product reflects that. Uh, to ask a question, uh, just text it in the box uh, that I think typically is to the right, uh, and uh, we'll pass that on. Um, I wanted to go back to one of the earlier uh, comments where you were talking about uh, the ability, you were describing the ability to detect uh, uh, soil movement uh, up to several weeks in advance. And I wondered if you could kind of elaborate when you say get a six week, so there's no apparent apparent movement visibly, but you're able to detect that. How much, uh, are, how accurate are you able to detect uh, how quickly a potential catastrophic event would take place? Are there, is there information that can be used to do some kind of prediction? Um. Prediction, myself as a fiber sensing guy, I cannot do that. But the people who are looking at such pipelines and they are seeing the, the strain building up and the, the, the speed at which it builds up and knowing the land um, can take the measure on, on due time. So yes, you can use that information uh, to react. Uh, if, if you see that strain is building up extremely quickly, um, you know you don't have much time to, to do things. But if you have a very gradual increase of strain, then you can somehow relax a little bit uh, and, and take your time to, to put in place the, the measure that you need uh, to, to safeguard the, the asset. So yes, uh, it, it's very important to be able to grab those uh, initial movement um, at, at the early beginning. There has been cases where nothing was uh, seen on top of the land. Uh, before it was more or less too late, but the fibers could already see that the land was moving underneath. So it's crucial. So really other factors have to go into that. Uh, moving forward on the sort of civil engineer applications, uh, you described obviously putting fiber into the concrete, which would take place when, when, uh, uh, when either substantial refurbishment was going on or when the structure was being built. Could you kind of describe the scenarios where retrofitting, uh, you don't have that luxury, but you're able to put fiber along the asset. Um, can you kind of go through the, the pluses and minuses of how to do that? Well, obviously, um, if, if you can get the fiber uh, during the, the the, the, the processing of the of the asset, the excavation or whatever, uh, it's much easier. Um, the fibers have been retrofitted in, in tunnels or on bridges, basically by uh, fixing them uh, with anchors or, or, or gluing or, or so on on the structure uh, later on. So that's a, that's a way of uh, retrofitting. Um, if you have to to make a trench in the pipeline right of way. It's a bit more difficult, but that has been done also as a retrofit for a ground movement. So basically you, you know the, the right of way and you know roughly where the pipe is in the right of way. 
things like this tends to move a little bit over time. And then you take some margin and you, and you make a small trench and then you lay the, the cable for ground movement. So uh, retrofit is, is possible. Uh, it depends on the application you want to do. If it's about a retaining wall or, or a pile, then obviously you have to do it um, at, at the time you, you process the uh, asset. So it's application dependent, but there are retrofitting possibilities, yes. So the next question is about the sort of which uh, optical fiber is best in uh, pipeline for measurements. Uh, and so they kind of run through a couple of possible uh, uh, linear or helico helicoidal. Um, so are there pluses and minuses and can you elaborate on that? Um, yes. Um, in the examples which were shown, um, if you get the fiber uh, in helix around the pipe, that's going to be difficult in the trench. So it's well suited for uh, an application under the concrete, for instance, because that's made in section and then the section are connected next to each other and you do the measurement. Um, if, if you have to install the fiber uh, when the pipe when the pipeline is in the trench or shortly before it's laid in the trench, uh, it won't be possible to go up and down and up and down and, and make the helix. So it has to be linear somehow. Um, if you are only interested at uh, elongation, you could simply strap the, the fiber on the pipeline. But if you want to look at compression, as we had in some of the examples, you make sure that compression is transferred, so you need to glue it. So th there isn't a, a, a best fiber for a pipeline or a best fiber for a tunnel. There is a best fiber for the condition of the application. If you spray the fiber in the concrete, you make you need to make sure that, that that sensing cable is going to survive the spraying of the concrete. So it's a heavy duty cable. But, but if you install the cable in a little uh, trench in the concrete and then you put mortar uh, or, or, or whatever to, to secure it in there, then you can work with a much lighter and much cheaper cable uh, because you, you do that in, in a more gentle way. Um, so I cannot give a, a, a true answer. You always have to look for the application. We discussed the fact that um, there are cases where we need temperature and strain. So you can select a cable that has the, the functionalities of the fibers to address both that, or you can take two cables that you put together into the installation. Multiple possibilities. Um, the, the best is, is basically to uh, to discuss with uh, the sensing cable supplier or the interrogator supplier uh, who has the expertise with those applications and to figure out what is the best solution for the job. Okay. Now, uh, the next question has to do with uh, the length of time. So how long have these applications been used and kind of what kind of what lessons have been learned over time as a result of uh, the, the history of it being used? Um, well, the, the, the first application are probably uh, a bit more than 20 years old now. Um, so what has been learned is that it's reliable. Uh, what has been learned also probably is, is the need of uh, an understanding of the application and selecting the, the right cable. Um, I've heard of cable who broke in concrete. So obviously they were not uh, good enough for the for the application. So you have to take care of that. Um, the the measurement of temperature and strain has been found very important in some cases. So the, um, the fact that you measure the temperature and you compensate is important. I think the the most important lesson is probably that you need to understand the structure. You need to understand what you are doing. If I look at purely what comes out of Brillouin uh, as a strain measurement system, then basically you have a, a curve which has a, a linear distance horizontally and some elongation compression vertically. Um, that's what Brillouin does. Now, to understand that you have a retaining wall which is kind of flexing in multiple dimension is not necessarily straightforward. But everything you do see in the measurement has a physical explanation in the asset. So the, the key to me is to understand the asset that you are measuring to make sure that you understand the data in the best way and you can make the best use of the, of the data. That, that would be my message. Uh, if you understand your asset and you understand the data, 
then you can really do something useful and, and prevent, for instance, failure. So the next question I'm, I, I'm sure is not a plant, but the question is it, it, an observation that this looks like it could be very useful in mining operations, and particularly mentioning potash uh, mines. Uh, where uh, structural health is I important. Has it been used, uh, has the technology been used in those applications? Uh, yes, there has been application in mining. Um, I don't have data myself, so not so much I can share, but yes, that has been done too. And uh, next question is, I, I guess, kind of a setup. Well, uh, is fiber uh, cable life sufficient over the concrete structure lifetime? <laughs> this is a very interesting question. Uh, in optics, when we say the cable goes for, uh, for a long time, we probably think 25 years or 50 years. Um, I have the feeling that uh, my civil engineering friends, then we design a bridge, they do that more for 100 years or so. Um, so it's long lifetime, probably shorter than the lifetime of the structure. So maybe we would have to um, to refurbish or to to have a, a mean of uh, adding a fiber or replacing the fiber over time. Uh, I heard of people thinking of that. So for instance, uh, leaving in the uh, in the structure a, a tube, an empty tube, where you could in 25 years lay another fiber. Uh, and then put some some uh, concrete or, or whatever uh, refilling material, and then continue measuring strain with uh, with new fiber. So um, I think it's it's possible to go a, a long time. Thank you. Um, in in rock engineering sites, it's common to have some localized strains uh, along discontinuities, which can happen in in ranges below the special resolution for sensors and i guess that may be a question so any thoughts about using distributed sensing to de detect these events so i guess the question is are these uh sort of localized strains picked up by the by sensing i would say um yes um, we, we've seen that uh, instruments have spatial resolution down to 25 centimeters, 20 centimeters, something like this. So um, I would think that um, if you have a if you have a cable uh, nearby those events, you should you should see them eventually. I'm not aware myself of of trials in 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 that domain directly though. So forgive me for the next question, because I really don't know what I'm asking, but the question is, please comment the difference between BOTDA and BOTDR from an application <laughs> point of view. <laughs> so I hope that makes sense to you, because I'm afraid it doesn't to me. It, it does, Mark, thank you, yes. Um, a BOTDR has a, a single fiber. So you just connect the fiber to the instrument and then you go to the end of the fiber and that's the end of the system. In a BOTDA, you are measuring in, in a loop configuration. So you have a, a fiber that goes out of the instrument and then comes back. Uh, in terms of application, um, difficult to say uh, again, um, I am rather a BOTDA guy, so I would say in all conditions you make a loop, um, and that's that's the way. And my colleagues who are more in BOTDR would say let's uh, use a, a BOTDR. Um, yeah, D difficult difficult to comment. When you do measurement of temperature and, and strain uh, in a single cable, then you do have a loop. So by measuring in BOTDA, you just have a, a single channel. So that could be an advantage, but difficult to comment uh, more on that. Um, you will have the same also for the other uh, Brillouin versions of so the BOFDR and BOCDR. Uh, each have uh, some, some specific point, but I, I can't really uh, comment more on, on that. Okay, next question is, are the interrogators uh, custom for the application? No, the interrogator are generics. Um, the, the interrogator is just sending light down the fiber and then looking at the backscattering. So it's it's application agnostic as such. Um, the the processing software that transforms the brain signal into uh, strain data is also generic. Uh, what could be specific to a, to a given application is the computation layer 
on top of the of the strain measurement to give information to a particular asset. Uh, so if you if you want to compute the deformation of, of a wall, as, as we've seen in the application, then obviously you need um, a computation layer that transforms the linear measurements of the strain into a deformation in, in, in a two or three dimension. But the interrogator as such is generic. So I think that's bringing us up to the last of the hour. I do have a couple of other questions, but I guess I think I'll encourage uh, there a number of email addresses up. So there's a wealth of resources that are available to uh, uh, folks who want to follow up with uh, additional questions. Um, uh, one question always comes up. Yes, this whole presentation will be available on the FOSA website, actually on our YouTube page. Uh, fairly quickly, we usually get it within a day, if 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 not shorter. So within a couple of hours, so people can be able to go through this in in great detail. Uh, also coming up in uh, June, we have uh, two more webinars. We've of course stepped up the pace because of the current conditions. So in um, on June 11, 11th, uh, Weir Jones will be having a structural integrity monitoring pipeline and geohazard. So really following up on some of the questions or some of the issues that we talked about today. And then on June 18th, HiFi will have uh, value added pipeline applications using high fidelity fiber optic monitoring and machine learning. So a, a more pipeline centric uh, uh, a presentation. So uh, to uh, Etan and, and also to all the members of the uh, uh, technology committee that participated in developing this presentation, we really thank you for what was a, a very informative uh, uh, presentation. Thank you. And that concludes the webinar.